All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to a Sunday evening edition here, a live stream here with Wick Goes Carnivore. I have a special guest today, Johnny Wood from The Champion Within. How are you doing, Johnny? I'm doing pretty good, Brian. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Um, so what did you have to eat today? Let's start with that, and then we'll get into your story. Give everybody a few minutes to kind of get in onto this live stream, and then we'll go into your story. So for now, what did you eat today? Well, uh, started out this morning. I just had a big chunk of butter. Uh, my wife and I had some shopping to do today. We went to Costco uh, looking for a new freezer, wanting to maybe start buying uh, beef by the cow or you know, half a cow or quarter cow. So we're looking for a new freezer. And the closest Costco to where we live is about 18 miles away. So we kind of made a day out of it, went there. And then uh, after we finished there, we went to Food Line and then we went to Wendy's and I had me a couple of burger patties and a little bit of bacon. And then I came home and fixed. Uh, my wife had bought a New York strip for herself and I had a couple little lethal chuck steaks, these little small chuck steaks. So I threw some charcoal on the grill, got the grill fired up, and I had those. So a pretty good day today. Good, good. So basically beef and butter and bacon. That's what I've had today. <laughs> All right. I, I can't complain about that, right? <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to get started with your story. As people are coming in, uh, say hi in the chat. Um, hit the like button so that we can get this out to uh, more people. That'll help the algorithm to you know push out some more people. But Johnny, let's get started with your story. Uh, let's kind of start for people um, that aren't familiar with you. So let, let's talk about like how you started Carnivore and then go from there. All right, Brian, I appreciate it. Uh, first of all, I'm going to apologize for my voice. I got a little cold uh, last Thursday. I'm kind of getting over it now, but the voice is still there a little bit. But uh, yeah, for years and years, I was very unhealthy, you know, had the standard American diet, ate fast food, French fries, soda, honey buns, donuts, you know, all that garbage. I worked in emergency medicine. I was a paramedic for about 25 years. And um, uh, towards the end of my career, I became, uh, you know, really obese really inflamed. I was working the night shifts. I worked seven at night to seven in the morning. So my circadian rhythm was all messed up. Uh, I would basically get off my shift to go to the local Bojangles, get a couple of biscuits and um, some uh, honey buns or whatever, eat and then go home and go to bed. And of course that didn't serve me well. Um, but I eventually got to the point to where I was literally so inflamed, so obese and so unhealthy that I, I literally could not do the job anymore. And so my employer, uh, they let me go. They fired me. And, um, you know, that created a dilemma because I wasn't old enough to retire. I couldn't draw retirement or anything. So what do you do? So I was behind an 18 wheeler coming up the interstate and on the back of the 18 wheeler, it said now hiring drivers start and pay 50,000 a year, which is actually more money than I made as a paramedic, if you can believe that. So I made the phone call, signed up. I went to truck driving school, which was just six weeks. Uh, six days a week for six weeks, got my commercial driver's license and uh, found a job that I could do. I could physically sit there and drive the truck. You know, I couldn't work on an ambulance. I couldn't work in a factory. There's really not a whole lot I could do. So I found a job that pretty much worked with me. I could sit and I could drive so I could make a living, pay my bills and still be able to work. So I did that. Uh, but that just made a bad situation worse because now I'm sitting, you know, constantly and I'm eating terrible stuff. And uh, every year as a truck driver, you have to go to the doctor and get a physical. The Department of Transportation requires that all truck drivers get a physical either every year or every other year. And because I was so unhealthy, I had sleep apnea real bad. They made me get a physical every year. Well, in 2021, I think it was, yeah, 2021, I was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And I was on my way back to Charlotte, where I live, to do my annual physical. And I, went in, I had been having these little bouts of AFib off and on. And uh, it actually got real bad. And I went into AFib with a rapid ventricular response, which basically means my heart was just going crazy. And I was in Iowa, and this is still pretty much during the pandemic. So I just started popping aspirin and driving home, got home, uh, went to the hospital, was admitted right away. They shocked me a couple times, uh, ended up having, having an ablation, uh, kind of got that fixed. But in the meantime, I had to sell my truck because, you know, I went like two months without working and I had a really big truck payment and insurance payments and all that stuff. And uh, so I had to sell the truck because I had no money coming in because obviously I couldn't drive while I was going through all that. So I sold the truck. I got a little bit of money from the truck, which gave me about a year to try to address some health issues. 
took up the game of golf at the insistence of my brother. Started, you know, playing golf, getting out, being more active. But I didn't change my diet. So it only helped marginally. And then I ended up getting a job at Lowe's where I was working. And um, I don't know, it was just my feet were inflamed. I had really bad plantar fasciitis. I had really bad hip pain, knee pain. And I was just struggling through. And I didn't think there was any way I could actually do this, you know, for years and years because I was hurting pretty bad. Well, my wife and I are wanting to sell our um, suburban home and buy a homestead. We'd get some property and move out to the country, get some property, and maybe raise our own food. And I ran across uh, Kerry Mann's Homestead How video, his, uh, I think it was his 30 day update or whatever on the carnivore diet. And I'd heard of carnivore before and I'd tried keto before. But I watched Sean's video, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Kerry's video, which led me to Sean White's video. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, I said, well, Daniel, this can't hurt, so I'm going to give it a try. So that was in June of last year. So July 1st, I just started carnivore, cold turkey. And uh, Brian, to be honest with you, within two weeks, a lot of my symptoms started getting better. I was losing about a pound a day of weight, which was incredible. The plantar fasciitis in my feet basically just melted away. And that was the, that was the worst thing on a day-to-day -day basis. Dealing with my feet hurting so bad, especially working on a concrete floor, was just like cruel and unusual punishment. But after about two weeks of carnivore, my plantar fasciitis went away. Within another week, my hip pain went away. I was still losing weight. I started having more energy. I felt like doing things. And so I just stuck with it, you know, really disciplined, really strictly. And I uh, was able to, you know, get to the point where I lost so much weight. I was exercising. I was doing 5Ks. I was working out. I thought, you know, I could probably go back to driving a truck now. So back in December, I went and took my DOT physical and passed with flying colors, you know, thanks to the carnivore diet. Well, the market has changed a lot from then to now. Diesel fuel is so much more expensive. Diesel exhaust fluid is more expensive. Freight rates are really down because there's more trucks and drivers than we really need right now. So that drives rates way down. And so I got out there with this brand new truck with this huge payment, all this insurance uh, payments for the truck and everything. And uh, found it, things had changed so much that it was going to be really tough for me to make that work. And was just under a lot of stress. I mean, just every day wondered because, you know, a lot of you get paid every week as a truck driver. And a lot of weeks at the end of the week, I'd worked all week and I didn't get a paycheck at all because you buy your fuel kind of on credit. And at the end of the week, they deduct that from your earnings and your truck payment and your insurance and your plates and all. So there were many, many weeks that I worked that at the end of the week, I didn't get a paycheck. I didn't get nothing. Some, some weeks I owed more money. I'd worked all week and I still owed money. Well, you know, the stress of that at my age of 57 years old was like, man, this isn't working at all. What am I going to do? This is um, more stress than I had felt in a very long time. And uh, I was working out in the Midwest and I was in uh, Wilmington, Illinois one day back in January. It's just to the west of Chicago. And it was 30 degrees below zero with the wind chill. Just miserable. So I'm stressed to the max about the job. I'm in miserable, you know, snowy blizzard conditions. <laughs> Uh, my load was delayed by like 28 hours. So I'm sitting there for 28 hours waiting to get loaded. And the reason they didn't load me is because nobody could get to work because the weather was so bad. People's cars wouldn't crank. So I gave in. I went into the uh, truck stop where I was waiting. And I got a cup of coffee just to have something warm, you know, because it was so cold. Well, for years and years and years, I'd have coffee. I'd have a honey bun or a donut or something to go with it. And I said, oh, heck, one's not going to hurt. And you know, that goes one turned into two, turned into five, turned into a dozen, it turned into, well, just for today. And then maybe just this week. And then I'll get better next month. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I just fell off the wagon. I mean, I literally just fell into a pit of misery. And every day I would tell myself, today's the day I'm going to get back on track. I'm getting back on carnivore. I'm going to be strict. I'm going to be disciplined. And then I'd look at my bank account, <laughs> look at my finances, and look at the prospects of getting better. And the only thing I know to do when I'm stressed is uh, is to eat terrible food. I don't, I don't smoke cigarettes. I don't drink alcohol. I don't gamble. I don't chase loose women. I eat donuts, honey buns, apple fritters, candy bars. Just the worst stuff in the world. And I learned that at a very young age. Um, as I've said on some of my videos, I had a pretty chaotic childhood. My parents divorced when I was young. My mom remarried immediately to a guy that had a lot of problems. And there was just a lot of angst in my house growing up when I was you know, five, six, seven years old. And I would always go get something like a bag of cookies or whatever, something sweet. 
and I would either go in my closet and close the door or I'd hide under my bed and eat it away from everybody, kind of hide. And that was kind of my way of dealing with the stress. And so that pattern developed when I was, you know, my brain was still developing five, six, seven years old. And I've never really been able to, to move past that when I'm under a lot of stress. That's just, it's almost like, it's almost like a zombie. Like I'm going towards something that I know I don't need. And I don't, I don't know how to make that stop, you know? So yeah. uh, I was driving in Kansas city, Missouri and I 470 getting ready to get off on I 49 South. And to get off there, you have to be in the far left lane. It's like five lanes of traffic there, but you have to be in the far left lane to exit and exit goes up. It's an on-ramp that goes up and down and around. And right before I got there, this was uh, two and a half weeks ago. And that particular day, I was actually having a good day. The weather was good. I had the radio on. I, was, I wasn't particularly stressed. It looked like it was going to be a fairly decent week, you know, to help make up for some of the bad weeks. And uh, I'd had... I don't know, six or seven donuts that morning. I had a Rice Krispie treat. I had all this stuff and I had a cup of coffee to go with it. And uh, I got in the left lane. I was about a mile, maybe a half a mile from exiting off. And all of a sudden I had this really unbelievably bad, sharp pain come in my, my left shoulder. And this is my left side. Trust me. I know it's backwards in the camera, but this is my left side. So I, uh, this left shoulder pain just got really bad. I mean, out of nowhere in like five seconds, it was killing me. And I went to you know lift my arm up. And it wouldn't move. I, it was literally like numb. And then that pain went up into my shoulder, into my neck and behind my left ear. And then all in the back of my left, the back, left side of my head. And then the whole back of my head. Well, immediately I started seeing my field of vision just getting smaller and smaller. And I, I knew I was passing out. I, I couldn't believe this was happening. It was just, I couldn't believe it. And all I knew was I need to get this truck stopped because if I pass out, you know, I'm driving an 18 wheeler, 80,000 pounds of freight. I'm going to kill a bunch of people if I don't get this thing stopped. So I glanced in the mirror real quick. There was nothing. There was there was five lanes of traffic or four lanes of traffic to my right. And then an on-ramp coming on there also. And by the grace of God, there was nothing beside me. So I just pretty much hung a right, went across all those lanes of traffic, went across the, uh, the on-ramp there and got off to the shoulder of the road, popped the brake, rolled the windows down, got some cool air. That helped a little bit. I didn't pass all the way out. And I immediately dialed 911 because my thought process was, if I pass out and fall over dead, because I, I really thought I was dying. I mean, I truly believe I was dying. And if I didn't let somebody know quickly that, you know, they would find my dead body in there the next day when this truck's been sitting for 24 hours, they would, somebody would come investigate and find me dead in the floorboard or something. So I uh, was able to call 911, was taken to the hospital uh, back in AFib, which I'd been having runs of AFib for five or six days prior to that. And I kept telling myself, you know, I'll, I'll get this under control later. I'll get it under control later. And uh, so I went into full-blown AFib. My blood pressure when the ambulance got there was 220 over 150. My heart rate was about 170. And it was all I could do to stay awake. I mean, I was trying so hard to not pass out, even once the ambulance got there. And uh, they took me to the hospital, got me some you know drugs on board, got my blood pressure down, got my heart rate slowed down. Uh, they kept me overnight and then uh, – you know, let me go the next day. I told them I didn't have any insurance because, you know, being self-employed, I didn't have any insurance. And so they had told me they were going to do all these CT scans, all these different tests, echocardiogram, all the tests. And I told them I didn't have any insurance while well, they left and came back with my discharge papers and told me, have a good day, which kind of speaks to something you and I have talked about before, the state of health care. But, you know, I had no way to pay them. They couldn't guarantee that they'd ever get paid. Hell, I'm a thousand miles from home with no insurance. So they basically, you know, saw that my heart rate was down to normal. I was still in AFib, but that's, that's, you know, you can be in AFib for long periods of time and you won't die unless you have a stroke or something. So they gave me my, uh, my discharge papers and wished me the best of luck and sent me out the door. So my wife had to drive from North Carolina to Kansas City to come get me and uh, came home. It took us a couple of days to get home. We stopped and uh, I didn't want to sit, you know, in a seated position for long, long periods of time, being in AFib and the chance of a blood clot developing from sitting still. So we made several stops on the way home for me to get out and walk around a little bit. And uh, so by the time we got home, uh, I guess Monday, maybe two weeks ago, Monday, um, I felt better. You know, I'm still in AFib, actually. Uh, yeah, I'm in AFib right now. But <clears throat> I've been rock solid carnivore since then. I haven't had no desire to cheat. I mean, I was basically scared straight, you know. Mm -hmm. absolutely positively no desire to have any junk food 
because yeah. I don't want to go through it again because that was uh, that was the scariest thing I think I've ever been through in my life. Mm. So so let me summarize really quickly here. So you start carnivore in July of 2023. July 1st. And um yeah, and you're doing great. Um you you hadn't been going into AFib. It, it's now December, right? January, um, actually. January. Okay, so we're in yeah. January now. So it's been a good six months, right? Mm -hmm. And you haven't been going into AFib. You lost a lot of weight. Uh you've been, you know doing a lot of working out, running, um, push-ups and so forth, the jumping jacks, uh, not jumping jacks, but I'm sorry, jump rope, um, all that kind of stuff. Right. And, um, things are going great, but then the stress of the job and, and the finances and everything puts you back to eating the wrong foods. And so that was like January, right? So we're talking probably about, um, two and a half months of eating kind of bad, right? Yeah. Bringing you back down to that, to where you were before. And, and then you mentioned you had started going back into AFib for about five or six days before the day of the actual event that happened. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's a good summarization, I guess, of, you know, where everything was. Um, and so now we're at the, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, you're, you're finally back home. And from that point now, you, you mentioned that you've been really strict with the carnivore. Um, and how, how have you been feeling? And um, in terms of exercise, what have you been able to do there and so forth? Well, the first couple of days, I was still, still had a real weak feeling. I didn't feel confident, you know, doing a whole lot of stuff because, um, you know, I just had this, this, weakness that I guess because of the uh, blood pressure or make my heart trying to get straightened out or whatever. I am taking a uh, diltiazem, which is a medicine for blood pressure and heart. And I'm taking a, a blood thinner called um, Zorelto. So I am t taking two meds. <clears throat> However, after uh, I got home, uh, I started walking around the neighborhood. I ended up doing basically a couple of 5Ks, you know, just walking kind of at a good pace, but not running, nothing like that. And uh, then I started doing some sprints. I've been doing push-ups. Uh, I've been doing a lot of barefoot sprinting. And if you watch my channel, you see that I do a lot of that. Um, and that's the crazy thing. With the exception of this crazy hoarse voice I got, I feel I feel really good even though I'm in AFib. I feel strong, healthy. Um, I got tons of energy. I will say now that when I do push-ups, and you know, push-ups has always kind of been my thing. That's kind of where I've Center my YouTube channel around is how many push-ups can this old guy do? Well, now if I do more than about 30 push-ups, I, I, my heart rate goes way up. And it takes me, I don't know, a good 10 or 15 minutes to, to kind of settle back down and get my breath back. Uh, but when I do my sprints and um, well, weightlifting and things like that, it doesn't seem to happen. But I just want to point out, like you were summarizing a while ago, I didn't have any of these problems at all. All of this was completely behind me until I went off the wagon and started eating the junk food with the sugar and the seed oils and all that stuff in it. And uh, if you know, Brian, if you go back and watch, you and I have had a couple of interviews between then and now where I was not telling the truth. I was hiding this because, you know, I'm, I'm hiding. I'm, I'm embarrassed by this. I mean, who wouldn't be? But I was still working out just as hard as I could. And part of me felt like if I worked out hard enough, I could outrun the damage that this diet was doing. But the old adage, you can't outwork a bad diet, caught up to me. Cause I was doing, you know, I'm, you go up my channel. I was doing 40 pushups, 45 pushups, jump rope, squats, lunges, you know, five Ks doing everything I could every day, trying to outrun, out, undo the damage that I knew I was doing by eating this garbage. And, uh, it just didn't work out. You know, you cannot, you can't out poison the body and then expect it to not have the consequences. I don't care how hard you work out. Yeah. All right. So, um, you didn't really have any issues, right. With, um, any numbness or anything like that from the, the minor stroke that you had, right. You didn't have any issues. No, there. the, uh, my left arm, when the ambulance got there, my left arm was basically paralyzed. I could still talk. I don't think I was slurring my words. I don't remember slurring my words, but I, uh, 
Then my right arm got real numb and tingly. And then both sides of my face felt like I had like 50 Novocaine shots. Like I couldn't feel any part of my face. And typically when you have a, a typical stroke, you have one side or the other. If you have a stroke on the right side of your brain, it affects the left side of your body and vice versa. Well, this was odd because, you know, both my legs felt really weak. Both sides of my face felt like, like I'd had 50 Novocaine shots. It was a very unusual feeling. And then my right arm, the pain went away, but the numbness was still there. And then my left arm, I'm sorry, which was the initial. And then within about an hour, my right arm started feeling the same way, but my left arm still felt that way. And ironically, I have a first cousin who was a neurosurgeon here in North Carolina where I live, and he and I are pretty close. And of course, he reached out to me and asked me what was going on. And I explained to him what happened. He said that with my blood pressure being that high, it's possible that the blood supply to both sides of my brain was being a little bit occluded or cut off because my blood pressure was so high. And that's why I was having effects, you know, at, on both sides of my body versus just one. They're basically calling it what they call a hypertensive crisis. Like your blood pressure really can't go much higher than that without some, you know, tragic events happening. So, um, I don't know, but, uh, so I spent the night in the hospital when I woke up the next day, all that was gone. It resolved overnight, but they gave me, uh, multiple IVs. Uh, I'm not sure what all they gave me. I know Diltiazem, some of it, they gave me a bolus, which is a big loading dose of Diltiazem. They put me on blood thinners. They were giving me shots in my stomach, um, to try to keep any clots from, from happening or dissolve any clots that might've been in there. But, uh, so yeah, so as of the next day, I felt other than being extremely weak and, and wa I had that washed out feeling, you know, and, uh, within a couple of days that went away. But right now, now, again, I've been rock solid carnivore. I think today's day 17 since that happened or 16. And uh, I've had absolutely positively no um, carbs, you know, whatsoever. It's all been, you know, beef, butter, bacon and eggs and a lot of steak and uh, some fasting. I've been trying to fast between 18 and 23 hours a day every day. So I'm doing OMAD basically. Today I had a little bit more because our day was a little bit chaotic. But um, uh, so I'm hoping to nurse myself back to health. I'm hoping I can overcome this. Um, this AFib. I'm just, like I said earlier, I'm just amazed that I'm in AFib and feel this strong. But I think that's a credit to the carnivore diet. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. If I could just shake the stupid cold I got. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So everybody watching, if anybody has any questions for Johnny, um, go ahead and put them in the chat and uh, we'll get those answered. Um, so while we're waiting to see if there's any questions, let's uh, continue talking here a bit about things. Um, so you've been doing pretty much the types of things that you were doing beforehand, right? The running, yeah. the push-ups, all that stuff. It, everything's going good. So it doesn't seem like there was any kind of, you know, permanent damage or anything that happened from the minor stroke. So that that's good, right? Um you mentioned that you're still in AFib. I think the last time we talked a few days ago, you had mentioned that it's not as bad as it was there, right? Like right. when when you went and had the minor stroke, you you were um, pretty much in it the entire time, and now it's kind of going a little bit more intermittent right. for you. Exactly. Can you explain exactly. that a little bit. Yeah, when I first was in the hospital, first of all, let me break down. You now, keep in mind, guys, I was a paramedic for 25 years, so this is this is really right in, right in my wheelhouse. Um, when you have AFib, the hallmark of AFib, atrial fibrillation, is an irregularly irregular heartbeat. So you can have an irregular heartbeat, but there's a rhythm to it, like doom, 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 doom. So it's the same repeating thing over and over. But when you're in AFib, there's no pattern. You cannot find a pattern to it at all. It's just chaos. The top of the heart and the bottom of the heart don't communicate the way they're supposed to. And so when I was going through all this, when I was in the hospital, when I was in uh, Missouri, it was just all over the map. Now I'll have uh, episodes of what well, sinus rhythm where it's doom, 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 the way you would expect it to be. Then I'll have four or five beats that don't make any sense. They're just kind of all over the map. And then I'll have maybe seven or eight beats of normal. And then, so it seems to me from my, um, my way of thinking in my body, like it's trying to get back into a normal rhythm. Here's the problem. Most of the crap that I ate when I was off the plan had, you know, palm oil, canola oil, all these um, 
highly inflammatory oils. And it takes, depending on which channel you watch or which research you do, it takes about 600 days on average for those oils to work their way out of your system. So a lot of that inflammation is still, you know, within my liver, within my uh, vasculature, my veins and arteries. So it's going to take a while for all that stuff to work its way out. And uh, Brian, you and I talked about some of the hacks that I've been trying to do because right now I still don't have any insurance. I'm going back to work at Lowe's actually day after tomorrow full time. So I will eventually have insurance. But, you know, it takes a little while before your insurance kicks in, maybe 90 days or whatever. So I'm trying to do everything I can between now and the time my insurance kicks in. Uh, well, I'll be able to go and see a cardiologist or go see a doctor without going, you know, bankrupt from one doctor's visit. Um, so I've started doing grounding lately and uh, I did some research. And one of the things that grounding does, and this is peer reviewed studies, and I found three or four of them today, is it actually helps to change the viscosity of your blood. It's almost like a natural blood thinner. Now, I don't know what the percentage is. I just know that there are multiple studies from different countries using multiple uh, focus groups or, or sample groups, and they all showed the same thing that grounding or walking barefoot on the earth does change the viscosity of your blood. So obviously I'm on blood thinners, but if I can help that by doing grounding every day, then, um, then that just puts me a little bit ahead of the game. Plus staying strict carnivore, plus keeping my stress level to as low as I possibly can. Um, doing all I can to try to mitigate the, you know, the problems that come with AFib until I can get to a doctor. Uh, the prayer is the, the prayer is that it'll go back into a sinus rhythm on its own. And I know you had that experience. You were in AFib, you cleaned up your diet and your heart went back to beating in a normal rhythm without having to have an ablation or whatever. I've had so many people in my comments on my channel reach out and tell me the same thing that they were in AFib. They really cleaned up their diet and eventually their heart went back into normal rhythm without having to have a, another surgery. So that's what the hope is. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I might bring the, this one thing up here that Grateful Keto said. Uh, I know this is not the same, but when my heart used to skip a beat every fourth beat, I increased my potassium intake and the missed beats went away. Glad to see that you're doing better. Um, yeah, I know magnesium and potassium are like the first things that the cardiologists will talk to you about when you're like, when you have AFib and so forth, right? Like th they put me on, um, magnesium and potassium. Um, were you already taking that from before or? No, actually I never, I never took that, but now I am, I am supplementing. I am using electrolytes right now. I'm using the element LMNT, uh, but I'm actually going to switch over to the salty. It's another brand, a newer brand that just came out of electrolytes that you just pour in your your drinking water or whatever. And it has uh, double the amount of magnesium that the uh, LMNT does. And Brian, you sent me a, a link to the, the, the magnesium that you buy, and uh, I'm going to probably order me some of that too. I just don't want to overdo it with the magnesium because too much magnesium can cause you problems uh, in the bathroom. <laughs> it's a smooth yeah. muscle relaxer, so it can actually relax your your bowels and you know you can get where you can't control your bowels. So I'm going to try the uh, the supplementing with the LM, uh, I'm sorry, with the salty because it has a good bit of magnesium in it. And uh, we'll go from there. But I am supplementing. I am I am looking at my electrolytes right now. So I started, I wasn't doing that. I, I did that when I first started carnivore and it seemed to help a lot, especially with my energy. But eventually I got to where I didn't need it. But now that I'm back going, switching back over to being fat adapted, I've been, I have had a lot of diarrhea, which to be expected when you go from car, you know, car burning to, ketone burning, you're going to have some upset stomach. And so that's been the case. So that's what prompted me to go back to uh, using electro electrolytes, but I'm going to go to the one that has more magnesium and just see how that, how that works out. But I'm not, I'm not, I'm not averse to taking uh, additional magnesium. I'm just going to give this a try and see how it does. Yeah. And you know, that that was a good point that you brought up about the magnesium, um, really with magnesium and potassium, you don't want to overdo it. So you want to make sure that you're in that sweet spot, right? You're not taking too little, you're not getting too little in your body, but you're also not doing too much. So that that's a good point there. Um, but like you said, it, it's kind of for you, like starting over again with carnivore. Right. So, uh, and really a lot of people need to make sure that their electrolytes are, are, are and good, you know, that they're not deficient on, you know, sodium, magnesium, and potassium when they're first getting started on carnivore. So you're kind of back in that point again and 
got to really keep an eye on it. So exactly. Um, I'm glad that you're doing that with the electrolytes. That's good. All right. Um, again, if anybody has any questions, uh, just go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, uh, so let's see where we're at here. So we've gone through the whole story basically. So, you know, the whole, it was good six months or so doing carnivore. And, um, then we talked about how you've gone back into AFib now before when you had AFib before carnivore, the re the way you got out of that was with an ablation, but this time you're hoping, cause that was all before carnivore. So this time you're hoping that, um, you're going to be able to get out of it just with the eating, right. Um, and, you know, staying away from the, the processed foods and the sugars and all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and I will say one more thing, Brian, even after yeah. I had the ablation before I went, so between the time I had the ablation and the time that I went carnivore, I was still having runs of AFib. The ablation didn't eradicate it. I was still have them occasionally, not to the degree I had before the ablation. Before the ablation, I was just stuck in AFib and it would never convert back. After the ablation, I was kind of where I am right now. I have runs of AFib followed by runs of just normal sinus rhythm. But once I went carnivore, probably within five weeks, four to five, maybe six weeks of going carnivore, it, it, it went away completely. I didn't have a single one until I fell off the wagon. I didn't have a, I would lay in bed at the night and be real quiet and I could hear my heartbeat. Doo -doo. Doo -doo. And it was perfect. It was such a comforting feeling. Having been in AFib and fought that battle for so many years, to be able to lay in bed at night with all the noise of the world turned off and hear my own heartbeat and know that it was the way it's supposed to be was um, was a blessing. And and then to go and ruin that by, you know, the stupid falling off the wagon and, and not knowing how to handle the stress, didn't have any other coping mechanisms. I, uh, I think I put myself right back where I was. But the hope is the same thing that was true before will be true again for the same reasons, right? Clean the diet up, make sure I stay hydrated, do the electrolytes, limit the stress, sleep good at night, do the grounding, everything that we've talked about, hopefully I'll have the same result again. There's no reason to believe that I won't, but time will tell. Talk a little bit about the, um, the eating because you, know, you just said like, you know, it's stupid, right? But it really like you talked earlier about how that's how you coped with things throughout your entire life. So really it's, it's something that's been in, ingrained in you in, um, you know, it, it's kind of an addictive thing, right? It, it's, it's hard. And, and I know how that can be, you know, where you tr try not to eat any of that stuff. And then you have something. And once you have something, it's like, okay, I want to have another one and so forth. And that's what happened to you and, and how you started the downward spiral there in January. Um, but I think that there's a lot of people that struggle with that. And um, I think it's good that we're having this conversation and that you're getting that story out there because it helps to show people that might be sitting here watching this, like, you know, I thought I was the only one that felt that way, that whenever I have something bad, I just can't stop eating it. But it shows that, you know, you had the same situation and, um, you know, I think, and I was just say, as I see here, that in here, you know, falling off the wagon is not stupid. It is a stress response, right? I, I think that's something that just happens. And uh, it happens for a lot of people. And I think this is good. We're getting this story out here and people can relate and and see it and, and see how it affects people. And, and I think for you, you know, you're probably sitting here feeling so lucky that you've had the wake up call that you've had without it being really bad because it certainly could have been a lot worse you, i yeah. remember you telling me that when you were first in that truck and you were trying to get over to the side that you thought that was it right like you thought you were going to die that day so you know you've been given this this chance to you know fix what you went off the wagon from and, and get back on it and you know get back to doing things the right way. I, I think that that's, that's a great thing. And you've, you know, you've got to feel really lucky about that. And I think it's going to help you to put things into perspective and continue to go on this journey. Don't you think? Yeah. And, you know, I did my video when I went online and did my video and I explained what happened and I, I was pretty forthright 
And that video has over 40,000 views. I mean, it, it truly has launched my channel. I would, I didn't want to do that to launch a YouTube channel and get it kind of going forward, but that's the reality, the reality, but I've gotten, I think a thousand comments on there and the vast majority of comments are, you know, it sounds like the person saying, it sounds like that I'm speaking for them. They've experienced the same exact thing I have. And they're so glad that I was able to be honest and forthright and come out and tell what happened and, and be honest about it, you know? Um, and a lot of people have said, you need to get counseling. You need to get counseling. And I don't disagree with that. I'm not averse to getting counseling. In fact, years ago, I went to a psychologist who referred me to a psychiatrist for this very thing. And guess what they did, Brian? After 25 minutes or 30 minutes of talking to me, they wrote me two prescriptions, Effexor and Neurontinin. They said, I'll oh, just take this medicine. So, you know, this is years and years ago. I didn't know any better. So I went to the drugstore, filled the prescription and started taking this medicine. Well, I didn't have any highs. I didn't have any lows. I didn't have anything. I quit caring about everything. I had no emotion. It was like being a zombie. It was the worst time of my life. I wasn't happy. I wasn't sad. I wasn't mad. I was nothing. I was truly nothing for about seven months while I took that medicine. And that was all they did. You know, they didn't address how do I move forward as a human being getting past that stress response from a five or six year old kid who's hiding under the bed, terrified that whatever's going to happen is going to happen. So this gave me medicine. They just had to take these pills. And, you know, I didn't even get the full hour. I paid for an hour and only got like 35 minutes. Oh, you just need these pills. Go take these pills. And I took them and it got to where I, I quit paying the bills. I quit, you know, I was being late for work. I was, just became a completely emotionless being. And so, you know, the thing about getting counseling, you have to go to the right counselor because most psychologists or psychiatrists, I guess I should say, they just want to push pills like any other doctor. You know, they don't, they're not really looking at the root cause of what's going on. So not averse to counseling, but the last time I went to counseling, it resulted in a, not a good situation. I ended up just quit taking those medicines and then went back to um, kind of being myself and then tried to learn how to deal with stress the best I could. But um, yeah, so right now I can say that for me personally right now, the stress level being out from that truck and not owning that business anymore, the stress level's 5% of what it was three weeks ago, you know. I feel awesome about going back to work at Lowe's, my former employer. They were tickled to death to have me back. I'm ready to go back. And uh, I feel good. I feel like I feel like this may work. And it'll work because it worked before. It worked for you. It worked for uh, Randy Cato, ground beef guy, my other friend. You know, other people have told me they were in AFib. They cleaned their diet up. They changed their life. And the AFib resolved without, you know, surgical intervention. And you start back at Lowe's on Tuesday, right? Yes. So yes, just a couple days. So 48 right. hours from now. Yeah. Good. Good. I'm, I'm glad that you're able to get that job. <laughs> That's going to help with the stress level too, right? That's going to help decrease it even more because um, you're going to be get, you know, working that job and getting the finances back in and everything. So that's good. And the, the beautiful, the blessing is not only did they hire me back, they hired me back and gave me a significant raise. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer I think there was some divine intervention there. Now I got my old job back and got the biggest raise I've ever gotten in my life, to be honest with you. Mm. And uh, so that's what a, what a blessing that is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That is great. All right. Um, all right. So I'm just checking in comments here. You know, we didn't really go through much in the comments, but let's just kind of check in a little bit here. Um, Darth Carnivore is here. He's from um, Indianapolis. So good evening. Hi, um a number one meat eater uh from oregon been 67 years old been carnivore since july of 2022 and yes definitely was a miracle that johnny got off the freeway um without you know any kind of i mean that could have been very bad very dangerous if there were other cars there like you said it's just lucky that there were no cars there that you're able to get all the way off to the side and that you were able to not, you know, pass out before getting the truck off to the side and everything. Yeah. That, that's just, uh, you know, there was definitely some intervention. intervention. I can't even talk right now. You know what I'm starting to say? Yeah. Divine intervention. intervention. Divine intervention. And I, intervention. I just want to point this out, Brian. This whole, that whole episode didn't take 15 seconds. I cannot believe how fast that came on. It was, uh, it was scary. You know, 
if it had taken 30, 40 seconds, a minute or two minutes, you could say, well, I had time. This was like, boom. I mean, I can't explain how it just came out of nowhere. And it was, it escalated. The, the whole episode didn't take 15 seconds, yeah. 20 at the most. That was pretty scary. That when it can come on like that, you know, it was crazy. Yeah. I, I mean, like you said, you were feeling fine. You know, you felt great that day and everything. And then just boom, it just comes on that. That is yeah. scary. That is scary. Um, let's see. Rick is out here. Hey, um, Rick. Hello, Rick. He's working on a video himself. That's cool. Um, I know I already brought up Grateful Keto. A couple of messages. This is the one she was talking about, the potassium. Yeah. Um, let's see. We've got Pam here from Eden, Maryland. Hello, Pam. Hey, Pam. And I think that catches us up. Yes. Yay, Lowe's. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's definitely going to help the stress level. Um, so that catches us up with comments. Um, we're going to go a few more minutes here. So if anybody has any questions, uh, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Um, I want to, you know, be good with everybody's time here. I don't want to spend too much time here. So we're just going to go a few extra minutes here. Um, anything else that you want to talk about before um, we start wrapping things up, Johnny? Yeah, I just want to talk a little bit more about some of the hacks that I'm trying to do. Obviously, I'm still taking the medicine that they prescribed for me, really trying to, you know, turn my screens off about 30 minutes before I go to bed so that I can get a really good night's sleep, uh, staying carnivore, doing the intermittent fasting, um, trying to get out in the sun. As you can see, I've got a little bit of sun on my face. I was out in the sun all day yesterday and most of the day today. Um, so trying to get all that vitamin D, the most vitamin D I can get. But this grounding thing, I, you know, the first time I heard this thing about grounding or, or earthing, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, I thought it was hooey. You know, it's crazy. It, it doesn't make any sense. I've never heard of this before. But of all the things I've done, Brian, these little hacks I've done, that's the one thing I think that stays with me the longest. Um, mm -hmm. I've kind of fallen in love with doing these barefoot sprints. I've put out a couple of shorts and in some of my videos, you can see me with my shirt off out in the sun doing these barefoot sprints. And when I get through sprinting, I feel good for you know the next couple of hours, right? But the, the, that euphoria kind of melts away over time. But now that I've been going outside between 30 minutes and an hour every day and just walking around in my yard barefoot on the ground, that the, whatever the feeling is I get from that, the, it's almost like a lightness. I don't know how to describe it. Like I feel like I'm lighter on my feet. That lasts the whole day. So there's got to be uh, some benefits in that. I did read an article today. I think I shared part of it with you. Uh, they took this lady. She was 85 years old. She was a diabetic. And she had gotten a, a ulcer, a, a sore on the, side of her, on the side of her ankle. She had some boots that were a little bit too big and rubbed a blister on her ankle, which turned into a sore, which turned into a gaping wound. And um, she uh, had gone through all the antibiotics. She had gone through. She was a diabetic, 85-year-old woman. She had gone through all the antibiotics, all the different drugs, hyperbaric chamber, and this wound would not heal. So... A friend of her doctors recommended trying this earthing or this grounding. And they actually got a grounding mat for her to put her feet on because she's 85 years old. She's not going to stand outside for you know, an hour a day. So she did 30 minutes a day for two weeks, just putting her feet on this grounding pad. And they have actual pictures in the, in the, in the article. They have pictures of the wound after one week and after two weeks. And by the second week, it was completely healed. And the only change they made, she didn't change her diet. She didn't change medication. She didn't do anything. All she did was grounded for 30 minutes a day for two weeks. And this wound, they had been working on this wound for eight months. They were getting ready to amputate her foot. And all she did was grounding. And it's and this is an article put out by uh, the NIH, the National Institute of Health, which I know there could be some controversy over what, you know, three-letter organization we can believe or trust. But <laughs> in this case, they're not trying to sell anything. They were talking about the benefits. And they had you know, like the, the um, x-rays or whatever, and the, the, the heat map of their body when you, when you ground versus when you don't ground with this inflammation. They took blood samples and looked at the inflammatory markers in the blood. And by just grounding 30 minutes a day, um, it's making a big difference in, in the amount of inflammation people have within the body. And they were talking about it as being maybe um, another adjunct to help with a type 2 diabetes. And you and I both know that people could change their diet, get rid of the sugar and the crap and really affect their type two diabetes. But if you can adjunct that with some earthing or some grounding, why would you not? It's free. 
and it's kind of fun, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's amazing how there's like these little tweaks that you can do that, and and you put a lot of things together, and it they make a big difference. Right. You know, obviously the the eating part is a huge thing, but then there's little things like the grounding, getting sunlight, different, you know, it's just other little things that you just put them all together and um, makes a big difference. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'll say, you know, I, I like to go out and do some barefoot walking as well for the grounding. Um, I don't think I get out enough. And I think we've talked about this before. I, I sit at a computer a lot. So one of the things I've been looking at is getting a grounding mat, like you were suggesting that the, how that, that lady had gotten a grounding mat. That's one of the things I'm looking at too, is getting a grounding mat. Yeah. Um, just haven't found the right one yet, but um, something that I plan on doing because um, I just don't think that I get out barefoot enough to, you know, to get the full effect of that. Right. So uh, let's see here. Susan is here. I uh, no problem about being hey, late. Susan. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that. Uh, Home said how was uh live from his uh movie theater earlier yep um let's see pam says does it matter what time of day that you do grounding nope it's all about positive and negative electrons it's all it's about so that and that really doesn't change with the time of day obviously um might not want to be out there at night you can't see if there's something that you can step on that could cut your foot or whatever maybe a snake out there a frog or something like that i tend to do mine in the day when i go to um Back to work at Lowe's, I'll be working pretty much 10 hours a day, four days a week from like 11 in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. So I'll have to do mine early in the morning, which I'm okay with that. Get up in the morning and go out there and get some early sunshine and do some grounding before I get ready and go to work. Yeah. And something I learned from uh, um, Professor Bart K, uh, this is not one of those things that like too much is a bad thing. Like you, you cannot do uh, too much of the grounding, right? You know, right. you think about it like, Back in the older days, people were walking around barefoot a lot more. Um, there wasn't all the, the the cement and the blacktop and all that stuff. And um, there was a lot more grounding going on than what happens now. We're in bigger cities a lot of times and so forth. We're sitting at home. We're, in, we're on our computers. We're watching TV. We're not getting outside and getting the grounding in. So as much grounding as you can do, go ahead and go for it. Right. Um, all right. So let's see. Um, I wanted to bring up, so let me, I've got it scrolling at the bottom and also going to bring it up here on the banner, your channel, uh, for anybody that hasn't already gone to your channel, this is his channel. It's at the champion within 96, 19, um, go check it out. Um, one thing that you're doing right now is you are, um, kind of chronicling your experience from having the stroke and how you're doing since then trying to get out of AFib with, with the exercise and eating regularly and so forth. And so you got a series of videos going on right now, um, that you're doing with that. And, um, I guess let, let's just take a, a minute or two here to just kind of talk about that and what you're doing with that series. And, um, I just want to kind of stress that so people can, if they aren't already familiar with you, they can go to your channel, subscribe and start watching those videos. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to just trying to document uh, for other folks and really for myself too to see, you know, if the, if this is going to work, how how long will it take to work? How will I feel as it's going? Will I make any tweaks to what I'm doing? You know, doing more research. I uh, I just want to chronicle it, and hopefully one day I'll be able to you know put my hand up here and take my pulse and say it worked, guys, success, you know, and then we'll we'll take the channel in a different direction and how to you know really optimize my life. But right now for me, the, obviously the main focus is, is trying to get out of AFib, get back into a normal rhythm in my heart to eliminate any more risk of a stroke because I uh, never want to go through that again. But I think it's kind of cool. And there are people that, you know, I've, I've gained over a thousand subscribers in the last week, which is crazy to me. I mean, my channel only has like 280 subs. Now I've got 1500 or something like that. And the comments have just been amazing. I mean, just the support, the thanking me, people tell me that I've encouraged them. That now if they decide to cheat on their doubt, they'll think about what I went through and they don't want to go through that themselves. And maybe I'm giving them a little bit of uh, encouragement or whatever. I can kind of peek behind the curtain as to what could happen. Because I believe that the carnivore diet is the diet that you marry, you don't date. If you're going to do carnivore, you need to do carnivore. 
because you can't waffle, you can't have all this high saturated fat and then follow it with seed oil and sugar and white flour and all that stuff. There's something called the Randall cycle. And I haven't done a lot of research in that, but apparently when you take in a lot of saturated fat, which we know is good for you, but it's good for you in the context of not having all the other crap, right? We know you can't kick all this animal fat in and then eat all these seed oils and sugar and ultra processed foods on top of that. And uh, that's what I did. And hopefully people can learn from what happened to me and avoid that same that same uh, path themselves. And I'm not saying I'll never slip up again. I mean, so far, knock on wood, I haven't. But um, that was a wake up call. It's I mean, the, the show Scared Straight, <laughs> where they take the young people and put them in prison and try to scare them into going straight with their life. That's me. That was that was that was unbelievably frightening. I, you know, I had I was already I had conceded that I was dying. I was just begging God to let me into heaven. I'm saved. I believe Jesus is my savior. I've, I've kind of settled all that. But in that moment, I, I knew I was dying. It was it was that was too late to pray to, to live. I was just praying to end up in heaven so I could see my mom again. You know, so that's that's where I was. That's how serious it was. And I hope people can watch this series and, and watch me go from the lowest of low, hopefully back to where I was before I fell off the wagon. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up the uh, Randall cycle. Um, that's something go check out. Professor Bart K has a lot of good information about the Randall cycle. He can explain it in very technical terms that I can't. Uh, but basically what it amounts to is um, fat and carbs do not mix together at the same time. Right. So um, essentially as long as you're doing one or the other, you're fine. Of course, if you're doing a bunch of carbs, a bunch of processed foods and so forth, that's going to give you diabetes and all that kind of stuff, right? But if, if you're going with the fat, don't mix in the carbs as well because that's when um, your cells basically fill up and then it, it causes other problems. Um, but again, Bart K, if you go check out his channel he, and do search for like the Randall cycle, he's got all kinds of videos about it. He can explain it in better detail. Um, so that's that there. All right, um, so let's kind of wrap things up here. Um, I, I do want to say William was able to make it in, so hello to William. Hey, William. Um, I know he'll probably be able to watch most of this in the replay. Um, and for everybody, again, um, I've got it scrolling here. Johnny's channel is at the champion within 9619. Go check it out. He's going to be chronicling. Um, how he's doing, how he's trying to get back out of AFib, uh, get back into a normal heart rhythm and so forth, and how he's been doing since the stroke. Um, Johnny, it's been great talking to you again. Um, I'm sure we'll be doing this again. And um, hopefully next time we'll be able to talk about, um, instead of having to go through all this, we'll be talking about how you're out of AFib now or something, right? And we'll be able to talk about some good things there. Um, thank you, everybody everybody for joining us tonight and um we'll see you guys the next time bye yeah, thanks brian bye everybody